From the dark mind of Edgar Allan Poe come these most chilling tales of terror. Listen if you dead. <laughs> But beware, only the bravest of souls should take this journey with me, for our travels will reveal terrifying visions of agonizing death and horrible nightmares. Our first story concerns a gentleman who developed attacks of a sickness diagnosed by physicians as catalepsy. catalepsy. The origins and explanations of this disease are still a mystery. But victims can find themselves immobile and seemingly dead, laying for hours or even days in a type of powerful trance. Even the best medical tests may fail to detect the difference between catalepsy and real death. Yes, indeed. It is an unfortunate person whose seizure should be so severe that he be very alive. <laughs> the first attacks came without warning, when I was alone, late at night. Without realizing what was happening, I would sink little by little into a trance state, unable to move and unable to really think, and yet somehow aware of my immediate surroundings. I could lay this way for days until I eventually came about to normal sensation. Other times, I would get sick and cold and dizzy and just collapse where I stood. Then for days, everything around me would be black and silent, and the world became dark and empty. And then, after an eternity, I would gradually come back to consciousness, stumble around my apartment, and attempt to clean myself up. Other than this strange trance once in a while, my general health seemed to be good, except for my memory, that is. Usually, when I would wake up in the morning, I would have trouble remembering where I was, and my general mental ability felt confused. It could take hours sometimes for my senses to return. My physical health remained good, but I had extreme psychological stress. I became obsessed thinking about corpses and worms and cemeteries. I became lost in thoughts of death and the idea of being buried alive. I realized that because of my condition, I was in unbelievable danger. What if I was away from home and had a seizure? If no one knew me or about my condition, I, I, I could be taken for a dead man. The danger I was in haunted me day and night. It was hard to sleep because I feared I would wake up in a grave. And then finally, when I did fall asleep, it was to a world of nightmares. Horrible images of death continued to torture him in his sleep and his waking hours were filled with agonizing thoughts of burial, tombs, and of the crawling worms. He became paranoid and afraid even to exercise, walk, or wander from his home. From his friends, he gained sacred promises that they would never allow him to be buried until his stiff body showed signs of advanced decay. He also made many other special arrangements. <laughs> I decided to take some special precautions. Among other things, I had the family burial vault remodeled, allowing it to be opened from within. The slightest pressure on a special hydraulic lever would force the huge iron doors to fly open. I had ventilation ducts made for the circulation of air and light, and emergency containers of food and water installed within immediate reach of the coffin. The coffin itself was designed to be oversized and padded, and was outfitted with a lid that could be opened from the inside with almost no effort. A baby could escape from this box. 
And finally, I had a fail-proof alarm installed, a large bell with a rope hanging in the vault. The other end of the rope was to be tied to the hand of whoever was buried in the coffin. That way, even if the power in the building went out, I could still sound an alarm. All of the work, all of the precautions, and still he suffered from the torture of his thoughts, the nightmares, and the future doom which awaited him. One afternoon, I found myself waking from the blackness of a trance. I began to slowly realize a faint gray light in front of me. It was daylight. I couldn't feel anything in my arms or legs. Then, after a long time, I heard a ringing in my ears, and then a tingling sensation in my arms and legs. Finally, I felt like I could move an eyelid. My blood started to pump through my body, and I began to think. Slowly, I was able to remember who and where I was. I knew that I had had a seizure, and suddenly I wondered if I had been buried alive. I was so terrified, I couldn't force myself to move. I didn't want to wake up and confront reality. After a long while, I forced myself to slowly open my eyes. It was dark, completely dark. I knew that the trance was over. I knew that I was now fully recovered and could see again, but everything around me was still completely black. I tried to scream, but my lips and my tongue felt as dry as leather, and I couldn't make a sound. My chest felt like there was a huge weight on it, and every gasp of air was an intense effort. I could hear my heartbeat, like an immense drum pounding from inside a vast cave. My attempt to move my mouth showed me that it was sewn shut, the way morticians sometimes treat corpses. I also felt like I was laying on something hard, and that the sides of my body were also closely against something solid. So far, I hadn't attempted to move my arms or legs, but now I panicked. My arms were crossed and laying on my chest. I reached up and felt a solid wooden board about six inches from my face. It was then I realized my worst fear. I had been buried alive. But suddenly, I had a reassuring thought. My precautions, my alarms. I tried to force the lid open. It wouldn't move. I was trapped like an animal, even worse. I felt my wrists with a rope tied to the bell. It was gone. And then my greatest terror, the paddings which I had carefully installed in the coffin were missing. This wasn't my coffin. And I began to smell the odor of damp, rotting earth and things that had been dead for a long time. The conclusion was obvious. I wasn't in the family vault. I must have fallen into a trance while I was away from home. And strangers must have found me. But I couldn't recall a thing. Whoever found me, they must have buried me like a dog. Nailed up in some common, ordinary coffin and stuck deep in the ground forever in some deserted and nameless grave. As I began to realize what had happened, I started to scream again, and this time I succeeded. I let out a long, wild shriek of agony that reverberated up through the dark ground and somehow, miraculously, caught someone's attention. I felt movement and shaking, and I knew that they had uncovered me. My memory suddenly began coming back to me, and images started flooding my mind. Now I remember it. I had gone on a hunting expedition with a friend in the deep woods surrounding the James River. Night came, and an unbelievably fierce storm came out of nowhere. We took shelter in the cabin of a deserted ship anchored at the mouth of the river. We made the best of it and knew we were on board for the night. I slept in a bunk in the small cabin. 
This bunk had no sheets or blankets, with about 18 inches clearance to the boards above my head. It was a tight squeeze, but I slept well. And then the trance began, and my screams. The men who shook me were the crew of the ship and some workers hired to unload the cargo after the storm. The dark, earthy smell was the cargo, fertilizers, and chemicals. I had been wearing a silk handkerchief, and during the night it had slipped around my mouth, interfering with my breathing. And my friend had slept through everything, totally oblivious to my situation. From the tortures he endured came a good. His soul grew sober, and he began to travel exercise and to live free once again <laughs> I found myself breathing free air again I began thinking about things other than death and I threw out my medical books in short I became a new person and found a new life because of that unbelievable night I had been cured of my problems and my cataleptic condition was gone forever <laughs> he thinks his troubles are over. <laughs> but the demons must be put to rest. They must sleep, or they will devour him. They must be suffered to slumber, or they will return. <laughs> Our next poor devil finds himself on the edge, actually on the cutting edge of total terror. terror, 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 terror. A steel blade swaying, creeping, and coming down, swinging closer and closer in the pit and the penetrate. <laughs> <laughs> Was I left to die of starvation in this underground world of darkness? Or what fate even more fearful was waiting for me? I had no doubt the result would be my death. The only thing I didn't know was how I would die and when. What made things worse was that I was condemned and thrown into this terrible place for crimes I did not commit. I was innocent of all charges. It was totally dark. I reached out and my hands felt a stone wall, very smooth, slimy, and cold. I followed it up, inching my way very carefully. I noticed that my normal clothes were gone, and I now wore a thick cloth robe. He continued roaming about the dark dungeon, trying to figure out the size and shape, and perhaps, although unlikely, a way out. After a time, he fell to the ground from lack of food and rest. He then slept. I awoke and found myself still trapped in this living nightmare. I stretched out my arm and discovered next to me a loaf of bread and a pitcher filled with water. I was too tired to think, but ate and drank. Shortly afterward, I started my tour around the prison cell again. I had walked some ten or twelve steps very carefully when part of my robe got twisted on my legs. I stepped on it and fell hard on my face. He came out of his daze after a moment and discovered something unusual. Although his body still rested on the hard, slimy dungeon floor, his head was touching nothing. 
The terrible smell of the fungus had decayed, hit me hard. I felt around the floor and discovered I was at the edge of a round pit. Feeling around the stones, just below the edge, I succeeded in breaking off a small piece and let it fall into the hollow space. For many seconds, I listened as it fell and hit the sides of the deep hole. Finally, there was a splash into water in loud echoes. At the same time, there came a sound of a quick opening and a fast closing of a door overhead, where a faint beam of light flashed suddenly through the dark and quickly disappeared. I saw clearly the doom which had been made for me and congratulated myself on how lucky I had been to escape the trap. One more step had I not tripped on my robe, I would have been dead. Shaking all over, I felt my way back to the wall, deciding to stay there to die rather than in the terrible pit. Fear kept me awake for many long hours, but finally I again slept. I woke up and found by my side, just like before, a loaf of bread and a pitcher of water. An incredible thirst overcame me, and I drank the entire pitcher in one gulp. The water must have been drugged because I immediately got drowsy. A deep sleep fell over me, a sleep more like death. How long it lasted, I don't know. But when I opened my eyes, there was more light in this horrible place, and I could now see the objects around me. I had been wrong in my guess of the size of the dungeon. Very wrong. I had been wrong also about the shape of the room. The general shape of the prison was square. What I had thought was stone seemed now to be iron or some other metal in, in huge plates. Devices of torture were all about the room. Evil figures, statues of hideous ghouls, and skeletons were decorating the walls. <laughs> I now noticed the floor, too, which was stone. In the center was the round pit, the one I barely escaped from. All this I saw with great effort, for now I was on my back, laying on some frame made of wood. I was strongly tied to the plank by a long strap of cloth. It covered my whole body, holding me down, except for my head and enough of my left arm to reach a small amount of food left beside me in a dish. I saw, to my horror, that the pitcher of water had been removed. I say to my horror because I had a terrible thirst. This thirstiness seemed to be caused by the spiced meat left for me in the dish. Looking upward, I saw the ceiling of my prison. It was some 30 or 40 feet overhead and made totally of metal like the walls. In one of the high panels, a single figure got my entire attention. It was the painted image of a man holding a large pendulum, much like the ones used in antique clocks. While I stared directly upward at it, I thought I saw it move. In a moment afterward, I, I saw it was true. Its sweep was brief and, of course, slow. I watched the pendulum for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. I began to hear a slight noise. I looked to the floor and saw several enormous rats crawling around. They had come from the well, which was just to my right. Even then, while I looked, the hungry devils came up in troops, fast, smelling the scent of the meat. I squirmed and shouted at the ugly creatures. It took some time, but I managed to scare them away. It might have been half an hour, even an hour, before I again looked up. But what I then saw amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had gotten much bigger. It also was much faster. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had gotten lower. I now saw with horror that the edge of the glittering steel pendulum was as sharp as a razor. It was connected to a heavy rod of brass, and the terrible tool hissed as it swung through the air. I now knew what horrifying torture and death I was going to suffer. I saw that the blade was made to cross the body at the heart. It would cut my robe. It would return and 
repeat its cuts again and again. Because it drops so slowly, it would take many minutes for the pendulum to cut the rope. Down steadily, down it crept. It took a crazy pleasure trying to figure out its speed. To the right, to the left, far and wide, I laughed and howled with the thought. Down slowly, slowly down. It came within three inches of my chest. I fought hard to free my left arm. It was unbound only from the elbow to the hand. Had I been able to break the holes above the elbow, I would have grabbed and attempted to stop the pendulum. I might as well have tried to stop an avalanche. Down still, dropping still, swinging down. I gasped and struggled at each swipe. My eyes followed the blades, whirling right. And then they would squeeze shut in fear of the downward swing. Oh, how unspeakable, how unspeakable. I saw that some ten or twelve swings would bring the steel in actual contact with my robe. And with this thought, there suddenly came over me a strange feeling of peacefulness. For the first time during many hours or perhaps days, I... I went into deep thought. An idea came into my mind that the bandage or cloth which held me was the only restraint keeping me captive. The first stroke of the razor-like blade would cut through the cloth and I would be freed. But how fearful in, in that case the closeness of the steel. Any slight mistake on my part when I moved to escape would mean death. He decided to make the final check and tilted his head up to see the bandages which tied him down. The cloth tied my body down in all directions except in the path of the destroying pendulum. Just before losing all hope, another desperate thought came to mind. For many hours next to where I lay, there had been hundreds of rats roaming around. They were wild, bold, hungry, their red eyes glaring at me as if they were waiting to devour me. They had eaten all the meat which was in the bowl nearby, but the juices of the red meat still remained. He reached down for the bowl, rats biting at his hands, and came up with the meat juices upon his fingers. I totally rubbed the cloth bandage which held me prisoner wherever I could reach it. Then, after raising my hand from the floor, I laid very still and motionless. At first, the starving animals were startled and terrified at the change, at the lack of movement. They waited for a moment. Seeing that I remained still as a statue and showed no signs of life, one or two of the boldest rats jumped on me and smelt the meat juices on the cloth. This seemed to be the signal for a general rush. They came in hundreds. The rats swarmed all over his body, biting fingers, crawling over his mouth, and nibbling upon the meat-soaked bandages which held him prisoner. In a few minutes, I felt that the struggle would be over. I was sure I felt the loosening of the bandages. I laid still as the rats continued chomping away at the cloth. I knew that many places must already be cut. I was close to being free. But, oh God, no. The pendulum had finally reached me and cut through the first layer of my robe. The rats continued biting, and the man stayed still sucking in his body as far down as possible. The blade continued its swing and cutting, now through the threads of his underclothing. Closer, closer, swing, rip, slash, edging ever so near to his skin. I am near freedom. I feel the bandages getting looser. 
pain from the rat bites is terrible. But I know it will be my only chance to escape. I can now move more and more. Almost free. The blade is getting closer. It's dropping closer, closer. I hear the hissing in my ears. Our final story of deathly delights is a heart-stopping tale of unspeakable terror. If you ever had a terrible secret, or if you ever committed an act that your conscience told you not to, you had better sit back, close your eyes, and listen very carefully to this the Telltale Heart. True, I had been, and still am, extremely, terribly nervous. But why would you say that I am crazy? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all, my sense of hearing was improved. I heard all things in heaven and earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I a maniac? Listen and hear how reasonably, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain. But once the thought was there, it haunted me day and night. There was no reason. I loved the old man. He'd never done me any harm. He had never insulted me. I had no desire for his money. I think it was his eye. Yes, that's what it was. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it looked at me, my blood turned cold. And so, very slowly, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and to get rid of the evil eye. Now this is the point. You think I am mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how smart I was. With what caution, with what planning I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the entire week before I killed him. And every night, around midnight, I turned the lock of his bedroom door and opened it very gently. And then, when I had made an opening large enough for my head... I put in a dark lantern, all closed, so that no light shone from it. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how intelligently I crept in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, so that I wouldn't awaken the old man. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening far enough so that I could see him as he lay on his bed. (laughs) Would a sick mind have been able to do all of this? And then, when my head was completely inside the room, I lit the lantern carefully, so carefully. I had raised the lamp just at midnight, but in the sneaky light I found the eye was always closed. And so it was impossible to kill him, because it was not the old man whom I hated. It was his evil eye. And every morning, I calmly went into his room 
and spoke normally to him, calling him by name in a kind voice and asking how he had slept. So you see, he would have been a very sharp old man to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in on him while he was asleep. On the eighth night, I was more than usually careful in opening the bedroom door. I had my head in and was about to light the lantern when my thumb slipped on the metal latch and the old man jumped up in bed crying out, Who's there? For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night. Finally, I heard a slight groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain, oh no. It was the low, muffled sound that comes from one's very soul when overpowered with fear. Thoughts must have entered his scared mind, such as, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it is probably a cricket, which has made a single chirp. Yes, he'd been trying to comfort himself with these explanations, but they were useless. All useless because the shadow of death was near him. And it was this unseen shadow that caused him to feel, even though he never saw or heard it, to feel the presence of my head inside the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I decided to open a little a very, very little crack in the lantern to light a flame in the lamp. So I opened it, you cannot imagine how quietly, quietly, until at last a simple dim ray of light, like the thread of the spider, rose in the lantern and gleamed on the vulture eye. I silently gulped in terror because I could see the old man's deformed eyeball was open, wide open, and I grew furious as I stared at it. I saw it perfectly, all a dull blue with an ugly, gooey cover over it that chilled my very bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or body, for I had directed the lantern's ray as if by instinct exactly on that dreadful spot. I heard a low, dull, quick sound like what a watch makes when covered with cloth. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my anger just as the beating of a drum pushes a soldier into battle. But even then I kept still. I hardly breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried to keep the beam upon the eye. Meanwhile, the hellish beat of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every minute. The old man's terror must have been extreme. His heartbeats grew louder and louder and louder. Can you understand me? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at that dead hour of the night with the dreadful silence of the whole house being filled with a strange pumping, pounding sound, I got excited and began to feel uncontrollable terror. Yet somehow, for a few minutes longer, I controlled myself and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart would burst. And now a new thought grabbed me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled at my success. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled thud. This didn't bother me much. It would not be heard through the wall. Finally, finally it stopped. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and checked the body. Yes, he was stone. Stone dead. I placed my hand on the heart and held it there quite a while. 
there was no beat. He was definitely departed. Totally gone. Completely dead and out of his misery. His eye would never trouble me again. If you still think I'm a raving lunatic, you won't any longer when I describe the wise precautions I took to hide the body. The night grew on, and I worked quickly, but in silence. First of all, I took the corpse apart, piece by piece. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the room and put everything in the floor. I then replaced the boards so skillfully, so smartly that no human eye, not even his, could have seen anything wrong. When I was finished, it was four in the morning, still dark as midnight. As the clock marked the hour, I heard someone knocking at the street door. I went down to open it happily for. What did I now have to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves as police officers. They said that a scream had been heard by a neighbor during the night, that they were notified and sent to search the house. I smiled, for what did I have to worry about? I welcomed the officers in. The scream, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was away in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I gave permission to search. I led them to his room. I showed them the old man's belongings, safe, undisturbed. In the excitement of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and asked the police to sit and rest, while I, happy with my victory, placed my own seat on the very spot above the corpse. My head ached, and I got a ringing in my ears. But the officers still sat and chatted. The ringing became stronger. It continued and became clearer. I talked more to get rid of the feeling, but the strange sound continued and became clearer, until finally I found that the noise was not in my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale. But I talked more, and with a louder voice, still the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much like the noise a watch makes when covered with cloth. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers did not hear it. I talked more quickly, but the noise steadily got worse. I stood and argued loudly about anything, but the racket steadily increased. Why would they not leave? I paced the floor back and forth with heavy steps, but the strange sound continued to pierce my ears. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I yelled, I swore, I swung the chair that I was sitting on, I dragged it on the floorboards, but the noise rose above everything and wouldn't stop. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they didn't hear? Almighty God! No! No! They heard! They suspected! They knew! They were making a joke of my horror! This, I thought, and this, I think. But anything was better than this pain. Anything was more tolerable than this cruel joke. I couldn't bear those fake smiles any longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, listen louder, 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 louder. Stop! I screamed. I can't take it anymore. I admit the deed. Tear up the floors! Here! Here it is! The beating of this rotten heart!
you can run, you can hide, but you'll never escape the fear of darkness in everyone's mind. <laughs> Pleasant dreams until. What's that? Oh, it seems my friends are here to take me for a ride. Won't you grab your broomstick and come along? <laughs> In my brain, holding me prisoner to remain insanely lost in a mad domain of a most stormy life. Never to escape this mental strife, only to exist as the living dead. I lay me down in an evil bed. The mystery which binds me still from every depth of good and ill, from the lightning in the sky. As it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form, when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view.